celebrity stylist and I was looking for a way to create a, a sustainable shoe. So um, I was crazy enough to start a shoe company and um, I went to Italy and I um, created what I believe is the first luxury vegan shoe in the year 2000. And um, I worked with a factory there that later we now part own this factory. And um, we worked for two decades working with every single new leather that came out that was vegan. And over those years, we were in a position where we were so excited about them, but we had to adapt them and do different things and put shoes in the freezer and stuff to make these things work. And as we all know, you know, when you make a shoe, um, when you are wrapping a heel or, or, or a mounting a sole, there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of heat and there's a lot of different things that happen. So we learned everything you could about um, vegan leather. And then in 2016, we went on a mission to create our own. So I started working with textile mills, deeply getting involved in textiles. And at that same time, we realized we didn't want to make something that was already out there. We wanted to invent something ourselves. So I moved to the Bicocca University in Milan and started working with some awesome material scientists. And um, we created an amazing new technology to make a, 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 a plentiful amount of different um, leather materials that are made from reclaimed fruits and vegetables and we are not using any plastics and we're really excited about what we're doing um we're, we've got a patent pending and we're off into the races um this is exciting to be here on this panel and watch everybody um that's been on this same path rebecca that was great thank you and and actually it's a great intro into alex and what he does. And this is, I'm so excited for this conversation because I feel like there's gonna be a lot of great sharing and hopefully learning. So Alex, please tell us about your background. Sure, thank you all. It's great to be part of this panel. Um, as you know, as my title is showing here, I'm the work at Modern Meadow. I'm the Director of Material Science Research and Development there. I've been there about two and a half years. And by training, I'm a physical chemist. Uh, my specialty is really understanding how the nanoscale structure of molecules interact together and deliver a specific structure which is tied ultimately to materials performance. So I've worked across a number of different industries. Um, I've been with Modern Med about two and a half years now. Prior mm -hmm. to that, I've worked in polymer space, um, lightweight composite materials, which have got applications in aerospace, and also in the, in the food industry. And so it's yeah. been really sort of good to hear the analogy the, where we were in the food space and how some of the organizers at MII have had experience there and how they've helped shape and transform that area. So I'm really looking forward to hearing and anticipating how that will happen in the material space too. Yeah. Um, so really what brought me to the role I'm in now is um, like any scientist, I think what's kind of in the scientist DNA is ultimately technical curiosity. And I think that's, that's really what followed me throughout my career until you know you hear more and more about sustainable materials and so with an opportunity at modern meadow it really gave us an opportunity to really you know design for true innovation and disruptive technology rather than technological add-ons which is what i'm used to doing mm -hmm. and you know working with with you know committed brands in a committed industry whose carbon footprint historically wasn't great um having that level of commitment and you know being a part of that ability to drive that true innovation that will be taken on by these brands is really inspiring to me. Yeah. And um, so bringing on that, that sort of lens of sustainability to go alongside the technical feasibility, what's, what can be scaled up, combined with the commercial perspective. I'm you know, very used to technical and commercial being hand in hand in an industry, but having mm -hmm. that equal footing from a sustainability perspective is, is really great. And so, mm -hmm. We've been able to do that at Modern Meadow through our technology and combine in the bioalloy technology, which I'm sure we'll get into today, uh, with you know, uh, with our joint venture, which is Biofabrica, which has been spoken a little about today, which yeah. is our joint venture with uh, Limonta. So we combine our kind of core research technology with their heritage craftsmanship, their um, design aesthetics, and their advanced manufacturing. So we've been able to, you know, bring to them our technology to add as a drop in mm -hmm. into existing manufacturing, which yeah. really allows us to truly bring 
product to market in a scalable way that's available immediately. So being part of that for the last few years has been has been great. So yeah, that's the dream, isn't it? Drop in, drop in technology, yeah. drop in materials. Yeah. Um, so I just want to just point out again that this this group is so there's a really great holistic moment here because we've got two creators and three designers that we all need to work together, which is just proof of what's happening here in the world right now, which I also just want to back up before we even get into the questions, just to say that this conference has been so, um, so fulfilling because it's actually a conference about people who are doing things. It's actually about, it's not hypotheticals. It's not theories. This is actually people who are creating solutions. People are actually practicing all this stuff and, and sharing sharing the things that work, sharing the things that don't work. And again, as Nicole has pointed out, there's honesty here because we all grow if we share those those pain moments as well as the victories. Um, so I would like to start with uh, Jessica. So again, you have a, an unusual background since that uh, you came from the restaurant business um, and then switching into design. Clearly you've always loved design and fashion. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you even, because this was 2017, I think you started. Yes. So yes. How did you like? Not only did, how did you find material companies to work with that that weren't animal skins, and also that weren't the, the pleathers, right? The the usual uh, the uh, options that people had. So how not only did how did you find them, but also how did you find working with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I left my restaurant in 2016, I um, came up with the idea of okay, what am I going to do next? What am I really passionate about? And of course, it was continuing the um, the same theme. So working to encourage, you know, working to help people uh, avoid animals in their life in a way. Um, so I did food and the next one was fashion um, because I love and I always have loved fashion. Um, so back in when I started in January 2017, it was like, right, how do you make a bag? <laughs> and what's the sustainable material? So, you know, it was, you know, pretty much going to Google and looking at what materials were out there. I remember going to Premier Vision, which, um, you know, at that, I think that year, I remember asking like, so where does the cotton in this material come from? And people were like, what? Yeah, like, uh, and like, yeah. <laughs> like, is this, do you have like a non-leather section? And they're like, what? Okay, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> so it, it's, I've always say it's really exciting to see how, you know, the industry has come on in leaps and bounds in, you know, just a few short years. Mm -hmm. um, and so your questions were, how did I find the materials? And then how yeah, did so I you Google them? You went to Premier Vision yeah. and then, um, and then, and then it was like, so once you found them, how were they receptive to sending you things? And I mean, yeah, I mean, um, I remember Lamonta wanted me to be VAT registered, which for like a, <laughs> a startup oh, brand is like, yeah. Whoa, yeah. but I did um, you know, so you, you, you know, with these big brands, I guess you have to jump through a few hurdles to get, to get noticed. Um, and I'm sure it's, uh, you know, the case, the, you know, if you're a very small brand and you're just starting out, you sort of do have to prove yourself a little bit. Um, yeah, it's not as if you came from a big brand, right? You didn't come yeah. from, you know, Burberry, you didn't come from some other, you know, yeah. So starting out, I mean, you do the hard yards and that's part of the game. Yeah. Um, and then finding, so I remember the materials were, you know, a bit hard to find. I know I remember finding Pinatex and I was thinking, okay, this is like quite different to what I was expecting. Um, and then I was introduced to a manufacturer through a contact I had and, you know, um, took the material to them um, and they were, they were a bit like, what on earth is this? Again, this is back 2017, 18. Um, but, you know, they I had a good introduction, so they were happy to work with me, very patient with me. Um, but at the same time, I do have to, to say that uh, from 2017, I didn't find the materials that were ticking all my boxes. So I did actually start working with veg tan, real leather. Um, so I... You. Yeah, so I have, you know, had the experience of working with real leather because I just at the time... Uh, I didn't feel that there were any materials that were, you know, quite right for me. Yeah. That has now evolved and Luxra is a, you know, vegan only brand. But um, yes, yeah, so interesting. Could I interrupt you, Jessica? Did you find that working with real leather then helped inform you of what you were looking for with next gen leathers? Yeah, I mean, it also, you know, I had a, a vegetarian restaurant. I mean, vegan, I didn't call it vegan back in the day because that wasn't cool. Um, so uh, I think having come from a, a perspective where I actually don't 
like using animal products in my everyday life and then having a, a brand and using the material didn't didn't really sit well with me yeah. um plus you know the veg tan leather it, it's, it's very delicate in some ways it scratches very easily so you know that informed me like right i really want a material that's robust but also ticks the eco-friend eco-friendly you know mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's a very vague definition at the moment um yeah it's been a journey let's just say yeah. that <laughs> and, and so, Casey, I would pose this uh, similar question to you. You actually did come from designing using animal leathers, right? Yes, I did. And then when you made that leap, tell me about, you know, sourcing, how that worked and, and sourcing not only materials, but then factories. Totally. I actually have a very similar story, Jessica, um, where, you know, I launched Sylvan also in 2017, pre these plant and bio-based leathers being available. And I didn't come from the vegan space. I came from the luxury fashion space. Um, I came from an environmental and, and sustainability background as well. Um, but I really, you know, plastic vegan leather was like such a, like plastic was like the new like tobacco in conversations, right? Like no one wanted to touch plastic. Um, and I really similarly was trying to find something that did tick all of those boxes of, um, being a little bit more nature derived. So I wanted to make vegan shoes from the start. Like I, my first collection in 2017, I was like, okay, well, if I can't find vegan leathers, what else is available to me? So I was looking at um, fabrics and textiles, things like recycled cottons, um, things like um, maybe I could use rubber instead of leather, like just trying to find creative solutions that still fit within my parameters. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, like the best materials I could find, I was designing a winter boot collection. And if you're in New York or anywhere where there's weather, a fabric boot is really just not going to cut it in terms of performance and what mm -hmm. you really need. And I think that's such an important factor um, mm -hmm. That has to do with why we need all of the technical specs that, you know, there's a reason why we're imitating leather as a material and why it's been used in footwear and in fashion products for yeah. so long. Um, right. So starting with like wanting to do boots that that could last in in bad weather. So how what kind of materials were you looking at uh, that you could find that performed properly? I was working with leathers. I was working with vegetable tan oh, leathers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Similarly, trying to find <laughs> as minimally the <laughs> leathers that I could and was working with high quality things and really promoting longevity, um, yeah. which we still promote. Like longevity is such an important part of what we do. Yeah. Um, I was working with, I made a, a rain boot out of a recycled rubber tire material that looked much more like a leather than it did like look like a rain boot. So it was really nice to get that performance um, mixed with the fashion. Yeah. Um, so that was a, one of the pieces we were able to do for a boot, but ultimately I, I wanted to find a true leather imitation. And I had been searching the whole time I was a brand to try and find materials that really met my criteria. Yeah. Um, so the second I started hearing about like Pina Tex, I feel like was really the first plant leather that I, I heard of and coming from the leather space. One of the, one of the really, the, one of the things that I really looked for the most was like a really close aesthetic duplication and Pina Tex is an amazing material, you know, if, if it's very different, though, v visually than a standard leather. And so I, I really wanted a dupe. Um, so I wanted something to be able to sit and look exactly like a leather. So I waited a little bit longer, kept my ear to the ground, but I was doing some like a lot of research on my own. Um, mm -hmm. And then I have to give like a huge portion of my gratitude towards my my production team. Um, I started working with an amazing production team in Italy which is, you know, a, a hub for textile and, and material innovation. Yeah. Um, and I had mentioned to them, I was really looking for, I heard about these fruit leathers. I was trying to source some things in Spain. We weren't able to find it. I was working now in Italy. And like we ended up finding an apple leather supplier that was 45 minutes north of the factory. Mm -hmm. So I was able to travel there. I visited the supplier directly. Um, and I've been, and that was 2019. So I've been working with that apple leather supplier. Apple is one of my main plant materials that I work with. Um, and then from there, it was also finding factories, as you mentioned, and partners that were willing to test something new. And I definitely went into meetings um, and left. Like I switched my supply chain to find partners that were supportive, understanding, and willing to experiment because it was mm -hmm. I definitely challenged them quite a bit. Um, yeah. And having people who are patient and understand the vision. Like I always talk about factories the same way I talk about any type of partner, like it really is a give and take. So you need them to, to really be 
thoughtful and supportive of what the final vision is because it comes with extra challenges. It comes with extra prototyping. It comes with extra time. Um, there are styles we weren't able to make in these in the original Apple leathers because there was creasing or um, Rebecca mentioned a little bit earlier, there's a lot of heat that is involved in footwear production. Um, mm -hmm. There's different types of properties that plant leathers have and vegan leathers in general have than, than uh, standard leather and most Italian factories have been working with leathers their entire, like if not exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a training period um, and I definitely had meetings where I thought I was gonna be working with factories. I had one factory that was already prototyping my shoes and I walked away from them before placing a production run because um, they rolled their eyes and called my materials, you know, the Sintetico and, you know, it, was no, a, it wasn't Joey, it wasn't Joey Pringle. That's why you know, I know, and I love Joey. <laughs> I make it Joey Pringle's factory. I know. Right. But, um, you know, it's important. It's important that um, you find the right partners and the right people and that it's, it requires a little bit of extra patience yeah. and time for development. Um, but the, the, you know, you figure out the vision and you stick to it and um, you find the people and, and the partnerships that um, will help you see that through. Casey, you brought up a couple of things I definitely wanna make sure we address during this conversation, um, which is uh, the, the agricultural aspect of it, the inputs, which in this case it's fruits, yeah. and we know it can also be vegetables. Uh, but I do wanna talk about, maybe not right now, but in a few minutes, like talk about those inputs because I know I really wanna then connect that to Alex because well, I wanna better understand the properties that certain fruits and vegetables have that are applicable to performance in these next gen materials. So, but now I want to go to Rebecca because I think uh, to piggyback onto what you were saying, Casey, about the performance factor of um, it will not also actually like you pointed out too. It's the heat. It's um, what these things need to go through. I know I've worked with a few startups myself, and you know, they're, they're doing, they're brilliant at what they do, but they haven't been to a shoe factory. They haven't been to a cobbler to understand the pressure, the shaping that needs to happen. And that shaping can only happen with heat or with moisture or so Rebecca, I'd love to, for you to address that aspect of it. Yeah. I've had two decades of that. Um, it's been interesting. It, there, it, it, it definitely is. And I've heard many mentions of shoes um, over over the day that we've been together, but it's it's really something that um, working with the heat was something that was at at first when we were in the factory we you know we were working with other people's materials and we were able to learn, um, but then when we created our material we had a long period of time that we also had been studying we we part own a um, a, a factory, like I mentioned. So we're able to test our shoes and work with shoes in there and really get to that point where if it works on shoes, it can work on anything kind of thing. And so we've developed a lot of different strategies that we use to, to work on that. And then as we if we move forward and um, I was working with the textile mills making different materials with, for, with them, I was also testing further um, new materials that they were creating as they were coming out. Then as we fast forward to, you know, getting to the point where we have our own material, we actually brought our scientists, or they, they spend time in our shoe factory, you know, working um, and we have full understanding of the different temperatures and what we need. And so we have a, a relationship um, between the factory and the scientists. We're really able to have this um development come out in the way that we want it to knowing all of the obstacles we're going to come up against so it's been really quite a combination you know my life work kind of just came together it was um a, a, all these years of making shoes but studying leathers and yeah. then turning into this space where you know it it makes sense to make leather and then shoes are such an amazing part of it and one thing I haven't heard mentioned yet, but it's a really important part, is that 47% of leather consumed is shoes. And um, so this is a very important aspect of my company because we have, you know, clearly a very developed shoe company. We've been very um, active. We've made shoes for the celebrities, Miley Cyrus, Jennifer Lopez, Madonna, and, and gotten shoes out there like that. But we've also had times where we've been working to really help vegan shoes get out there. You know, we had Kat Von D come to me and, and ask us to help her build her shoe brand out because like Casey was having problems. So was she, 
And, you know, we were able to build, build out this huge, you know, vegan shoe line and uh, allow the world to see there's so many different options of vegan shoes and help her on her journey and help Kat go there. So, um, you know, really everyone coming together. And that's what I think is so great about this conference is, you know, the materials and, you know, talking about what our obstacles are, but also that there's plenty of room for so many different materials as we watch. And what we're doing is so unique because we're going with nature. We're not working with plastics or just using the fiber of an apple, let's say. We're actually working in a way that we're working with the polymers to make sure that we don't need to use any plastic entry and, and we're still able to get these results with my secret recipe. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you'll share some things later, not, not any yeah, sure. too much of a giveaway. <laughs> But um, Alex, I would love to hear from you. So here you are talking to three brands right now. Um, what what do you find brands come to you? Like what's their leading thing? Um, because, you know, from a designer's point of view, like, you know, we want it to be pretty. We want it to, you know, be emotional. And how do you, obviously the pretty thing is happening. You can do that probably more easily than the performance part. So where do you even get started with that? Or how do brands approach that with you? Sure. So I think, you know, from a, from a technical perspective, just sort of uh, point a little bit on what you said, we actually find at Modern Meadow, the performance side of it is actually something we can do a, a little more easily than the design aesthetic. We actually find that combining that with Lamonta in our joint venture really starts to bring that design aesthetic as well as those high performing properties to us. So I would say it really depends on the brand. Um, some brands have got different um, ways in which to look at sustainability. Some brands are very much highly dependent on performance attributes, mm -hmm. as well as um, the ability to control certain aesthetics, like a color, for instance. Um, some brands are extremely um, interested and um, really won't kind of budge a little bit on how they can work with the material, right? So understanding mm -hmm. things like its elastic response is critical. So how it can stretch and then recover its shape yeah. really really speaks to how these things can be manufactured as well. So we do like a myriad of performance testing in our lab, um, right from the kind of the core research tests. So really understanding in scientific terms, the, the real, what, what happens on the molecular level that's driving these performance attributes. So, you know, we can measure, anyone can measure a performance spec. You can take it to a third party and understand, well, does it pass so many abrasion cycles? So we can do that in our lab and we do. Um, mm -hmm. We like to understand why that, why that happens, why it occurs. And if you understand why it can occur, you then have the power to be able to control it through mm -hmm. whatever we might do, which may be changing the, um, the composition slightly of our bioalloy, potentially. Could you just briefly touch on bioalloy? I don't know if there's a way to be brief with bioalloys, but... <laughs> I'll try my... I'll probably try and um, go back to the food industry as well to do some explanations. So our bioalloy is Modern Meadows core technology. It's extremely versatile technology. And um, essentially what it is, it's what's called a miscible blend of a biopolymer and a protein. So at Modern Meadow, we really tap into nature itself we don't try and mimic materials that you know act like nature we use nature's materials so we unlock the power of a protein and its inherent properties mm -hmm. we then combine that with a biopolymer to create this new structure called a bioalloy now the fact it's called a miscible blend basically means it's not just a simple mixture right it's not just like baking a cake you would put flour and baking so together and you would mix it it's very different than that um, so it's rather like, um, so my favorite drink is an old fashioned, right? Um, and I like the fact you just get one of those big ice cubes. So not all this ice just dilutes it immediately. And so, you know, as that ice melts over time, it doesn't separate into two phases, like how a salad dressing might do with oil and vinegar, right? You get it separated. Um, mm -hmm. and you can of a salad dressing to kind of mix it but eventually it separates out again because it's not truly mixed on a molecular level mm -hmm. the ice and the bourbon however really is through chemical bonds and so that's what we see in our bioalloy technology as well so it's really truly miscible and the fact it's truly miscible allows it to offer up 
new performance characteristics that not that the biopolymer can't do and the protein can't do alone. So you're mixing things together to create a new structure. And I kind of mentioned before my expertise is in the structure of materials. Mm -hmm. That structure that you cannot see with your eye delivers new performance attributes. And so that's what we do with our bioalloy technology. So that's essentially what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned elasticity. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in this whole process, which is, I think, a key differentiator or what that's been something that a lot of next gen materials don't often offer. And so I, this question actually goes to Jessica and Casey, because I feel in just in talking to you two separately, I've heard you both mention that, you know, it, there's not a lot of give. It's sort of, it is what it is. It bends where you bend it and you can't, it's hard to wrap things or it's hard to shape things. So uh, maybe uh, uh, Jessica, start with you. On yeah. the elasticity yeah i mean when you're taking away the polyurethane component which is sort of as you were saying casey like tobacco of our of our age <laughs> you know that's when you that's you know so i've tried and experimented with materials that you know are very low in polyurethane or have no polyurethane and some of them as you say they crack you know so this was a few years ago again it's probably 2019 i made a production order i should have tested it but i was just a bit too keen <laughs> well and so on that note did you hear from any of your customers about this stuff or how did you is that how you found out yeah exactly i found out um yeah one of my customers had a wallet in ireland and they said uh, this happened it was also it was because it was in the rain um which was a little bit it wasn't just the cracking it was it was the rain that had started to uh make things go a bit pear-shaped shall we say um, <laughs> um yeah so you know and that was again as i said a few years ago but i know that materials have come in in leaps and bounds um yeah. since but it is it is one of the um risks yeah it's funny just a few years ago seems like a lifetime ago already but technology has moved things so quickly I and mean, i would say that the places that are commercial right now have been at it for 10 years, in some case a little bit longer. Um, but I feel like we are seeing companies develop things more quickly. Actually, Modern Meadows has been at it for a while, too, um, to bring that perfection, um, although it's progress to perfection. Yeah. Um, Casey, uh, do you want to speak to elasticity? Absolutely. Um, I think with footwear, um, you know, when you're forming a, a boot or a shoe, you know, you pull it over a last. Um, and when you're using either an animal skin or something that's high in plastics, because um, plastics have quite a lot of stretch and they can be made to do a lot of things, which is why plastic has been um, such an ingredient that people really go to yeah. for vegan materials because it can really mimic things well. Um, so when you're working with something that's using less of either one of those two materials, mm -hmm. uh, it, you definitely run into issues with, you know, how do you pull a material over a last? How do you get it into the shape that you want it? Um, and then sometimes that becomes a design challenge. I've worked around it in a lot of ways by adding extra seams or, you know, like mm -hmm. there's a lot of vegan boots that will have either a center seam or something kind of along the front of the boots so that you're, you're kind of breaking up where you would need that bend to happen. Um, and so sometimes I kind of lean into it as like a, a fun challenge of like, how do we work with the materials in a way that still is aesthetic, but that works with their performance properties as opposed to against them. Yeah. Um, so you're not trying to, you know, force something or a material to do something it doesn't want to do. Um, mm -hmm. The material will let you know what it does and doesn't want to do. <laughs> Hey, Rebecca, I wanted to ask you, so when you started working with your scientists in Milan um, and you had to address performance, did so were, were, was that a world that you hadn't been exposed to before in terms of like what kind of things they were bringing to the table? It was really interesting because working with... Um, I'm working with actual material scientists. So it's, a, it's, it's material science. So it was a different... Um, a new thing for me, but it was exciting because who I who I'm working with and who we are partnered with is is someone that had been spending a lot of time actually working in the area that I was interested in. And what we do is we're what we're making is making our leather from reclaimed fruits and vegetables. So 
we were in a position where, you know, we, we have all these happy accidents, you know, one of them is now we're, you know, as we grow, we'll be taking care of a food waste problem. That is a big problem. And we're taking it from agriculture, where there's a bunch of brews, different vegetables and fruits, plus different areas um, in food production and also distribution of food. So the scientists were involved in, in on both sides. So I really was big on communication and and it was a big part because I have this factory right so they're like family you know it's Italy so <laughs> we're we're family for life um, I always say I'm in the shoe mafia as a joke because we <laughs> part own a factory there and if you've been to Italy and worked there you know that we've got respect <laughs> and um We've spent so much time in, in that portion where we're in Florence, you know, where all of the beginning of leather is all the tanneries for Italy, all of this leather world. Where people go to Florence to get leather goods. You know, they go there to buy them. So I have access to that. So I brought that to my scientists, the best leather workers in the world, five generations deep working with my scientist who is like Leonardo of fabric, you know, so putting them together and watching that magic is so exciting. And then having them be a part of the, the gathering of the fruits and vegetables and yeah. being engaged in that part as well. So that, um, and it, that we have them understanding both sides. That's a very important aspect of having them involved, you know, not, not letting, you know, in, in a way it, the project get into the woods, you know, where you stay focused mm -hmm. on what you need. And then we've always had the knowledge of what you need to make shoes. So we had that as a backbone, but the scientists were an important part I remember a funny part where we were we were going through all of these reports of what they need, you know, to make shoes. And we got to, you know, in everything. They're like, we can do it. This is working. This is working. And then the temperature always um, with shoes, you know, we can deal with the pressure, but we're the temperature is so interesting to work with because there's um, moments where it's hot and cold. And so it's yeah. um, it's really been fun to watch them grow and learn about two new areas themselves and all of us come together. That's the thing about textiles in general, but specifically to this, this you know, next gen leather. But, it, you know, on any given day, I certainly have seen sample yardage come in and it comes in very differently. And when you reach the factory or the mill, they'll be like, oh, it was really humid here for like all week or it rained all week. And and it just affects things. Yeah. The first app, I was there for all the first productions of everyone. I think I know Casey here you're talking about. I saw his first productions. We'd open up a roll making 8,000 shoes and it'd be like completely different halfway through to certain people where we're just trying their best, you know, to figure it out. And we were yeah. trying to work with it. And so there's so many inconsistencies in all the beginning stages. And, and I, like Casey was working through all of those, making it work. And, um, it's how I gained the knowledge to be making our materials so great now. So it all makes sense, but it was really quite challenging. And also to get the Italians to be um, excited about that was something else. You know, first, my barrier was the factories where they're like, if you're not going to work with my cousin's tannery, we're not making your shoes. <laughs> and then there was the second barrier, which was the buyers back in the day. You know, I've been around a while. You used, used to sell the buyers the shoes and and watching what happened there and then working in the material and all the barriers that are there. It's exciting to see that, you know, we're getting through all of those. Mm -hmm. really that, those are great stories. Yeah. Um, hey, Alex, I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to, you mentioned something uh, briefly earlier, which is about the testing that you, you put your materials through. And this is kind of a, a multi-part question, I suppose. And, uh, and I hope that our other panelists will join in because I'm sure you might have um, tales as well. But how do you, what do you do? Because I, I know that my guess is that when brands um, approach you, they want to know what the longevity of this material is going to be. You know, when it, not only just as a material, but when it gets sewn, cut and sewn into a product, you know, how long will this thing be with us and what happens afterwards? So how do you test for that? Do you time lapse aging yeah. materials? Like, well, what do you do with sunlight, <laughs> abrasion? Sure, yeah, I can, I can comment on that. Um, I hope it's more than a comment. <laughs> yeah, uh, it could be a little, a little bit long-winded, actually, because okay. I go on forever about materials testing, but mm -hmm. I'll keep it brief, I promise. So um, let's just talk about when brands come to us with uh, metrics that they have, right? Often they're delivered in specifications, all right? And I mentioned before we can test specifications. Um, for instance, 
how durable it is. We can test its abrasion resistance and we can do that with industry standard tests. But yeah. as I mentioned before, we do look at the, the kind of the fundamentals on what really delivers that performance. And so that's really when we're looking at new materials. So for instance, we're, we have our biotech materials out today through, through Biofabrica. We've got further iterations of that to deliver new function. That involves testing beyond specifications. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of durability and longevity, so I'll just make the comment that for our current material, we intentionally design for longevity and durability, right? So what we really believe is that for materials, and we've spoken about the biodegradability recycle issue in, in, this, in this whole conference, but really at the, at the very top of the waste hierarchy, really is the is eliminate waste, don't create waste. And so if you can create materials that stand a test of time, uh, but also age nicely, like a leather does, right? You yeah. have a material which can actually soften when you've got oil on it, as you handle it with time, yeah. that can actually contribute to a material which lasts a long time. And so our materials are able to do that. And how we test for durability, we do it on various sort of scales throughout its development. So the first thing we always do is understand how how kind of stable to heat and um, mm. deformation, like as you pull it, is our bioalloy. So we actually screw Rebecca and Case are going to be very happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and then what we also do is we want to understand how does that translate to a product, right? So, I mean, we can do all that fundamental test and it means something for us as a materials developer, but does it mean anything to a brand? Maybe not. So what really means something is what does it look like? What does it feel like? Does it meet the specifications over time? And so, you know, it, we can't just leave a, a, a sheet of material hanging around for five years to say, okay, well, it, you know, I'll come back to you in five years with the answer. We have to develop some tests that are accelerated in their aging tests. So what we do uh, for the, those kind of product specific uh, aging tests is we do what's called a jungle test which also is known in the industry as a hydrolysis test. So you expose your material to warm temperatures and very high humidity, and you do that in a controlled setting. And with that, you can shorten basically the whole life of the product by about, I think it's 52 times. It is because one week of the jungle test condition equates to a year of life. So what we can do is we can put our material into this chamber and then periodically we can take it out and look at it, see if it's, you know, is it staying as, as it should? Um, yeah. If it looks okay, well, okay, let's test it. You know, things that often we can't see, is it still living up to its elasticity or is it yeah. getting a little bit harder or is it getting so elastic and not retracting? Yeah. So we do that testing over time and over aging. We also do the same thing with its color because color stability is also incredibly important, especially in materials that have got a biocontent associated with them. Things can yeah. get a little funky over time, right? Especially if you've designed for biodegradability, for instance. Yeah. Um, so we really need to understand that. And so we do that with this, with this faster test called the jungle test. That's, well, the color aspect is a really important part because that's often where the emotional mm -hmm. uh, aspect comes in, in terms of the brand and the consumers. Um, it's got to have an emotional appeal and that usually, not usually, but it often comes through co color. So that's, that's really, really interesting. So just briefly, cause I, I want to move on too. Um, but the color, so do you put it through all sorts of like light testing and, and, um, well, mostly light testing, I guess, as well as wetness. Yeah, we do. So we do like, we do light fastness, wash fastness. Um, and we also measure our color scientifically with a number as well. So we understand but the eye can't see everything. So we actually measure something what's called a delta E value. Um, yeah. And that basically gives you the, the whole color change. And what really is um, is one of the, the selling points of the bioalloy is its ability to absorb color because mm -hmm. our protein actually anchors on molecularly with the dye. Right. And we're able to use various different dyes, not just pigments, right? So. Um, that has its advantages too. You can use pigments as too if you want, but um, the fact you have this molecular bond or anchor between your protein and your dye, mm -hmm. given the fact your protein is nicely assembled in a bioalloy, that allows for 
your color to be kind of inside and out of all your structure um, for great color vibrancy and depth of color yeah. and the ability to dye that color as well so that's a real a real boost for our material is its color performance and again because it's bound it stands the test of time it doesn't just fade away that's awesome um i see a question from the audience i would like to put up here it's from christina um and it says um uh, yeah do any of the panelists also consider end of life and recyclability when choosing their leather alternatives or only performance and ingredients of the materials if so what is your decision process regarding this it's an interesting question yeah i mean i um, i've thought about it for both i mean i have shoes <laughs> and then we have um the the product coming up with the leather that we're launching and it's it's, it's interesting um, you know, we've talked about uh, many times about, you know, everyone being patient while everyone's trying to get everything right. And um, this is this is really something for me that's an exciting challenge of the future. You know, as you get your product to where you want it to be, um, we, we've talked about things with the shoes um, and in the past, but the leather is really our focus and making sure that it it has longevity and also has this biodegradability is something that we're optimizing right now. And it's a really interesting process to watch what we're doing and, and figuring that out. It's, mm -hmm. it's really the, the key element to, um, you know, I think sustainability also is something that lasts a long time. You know, we have people that have had some mink shoes for 20 years and they're still wearing them. So this is a really awesome thing. So you have to, Put that into the factor with shoes but then with the leather um we've been asked if if you know the whole shoe can biodegrade with the leather um being you know the only part that we're able to control ourselves because there's so many different components in a shoe there's you know up to 40 different components in this thing there's a heel factory a sole factory and inside so many pieces you buy a shoe and you think it's one thing you know so um I know I can control the leather more than I can even control the shoe that I've had such a long time. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting because we're inventing that ourselves or using um, part of the invention process to make sure that we can address that at the same time. Um, I have another question for, for I guess, all of you. Um, but the some of the materials I've seen, some have fabric backings on them. So, you know, presumably the, 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 um, next gen put the topping is coated on fabric and then some are you know material next gen material through and through like the mycelium things um when working with and and alex i, I you know I, i'm not even sure if you guys have approached it both ways or or singularly but i'd love to hear from the designers as well as alex on the benefits of either way or what you prefer so maybe uh jessica start with you sure um I think for most of my accessories, given that my, as we've been saying, the Italian manufacturers, which I think we're all working with, are used to leather and producing products out of leather, which has no textile backing. Um, that is more of a, uh, that's the preference that they have for working. No uh, backing. Yeah. No backing. But from the discussions I've had with many of these next gen brands, you know, the backing really helps, <laughs> helps with the material qualities. So, you know, it's, the catch 22 at the moment yeah yeah Casey do you agree with that or do you have a different experience yeah I, well footwear in itself is a really difficult category and it kind of is in its own uh land in terms of its needs for durability it's supporting the whole weight of your body in motion constantly <laughs> so there's a lot <laughs> of factors that go into footwear um that some other product categories don't have to deal with and I think mm -hmm. For footwear and kind of going back to the last um, question that was asked too, in terms of life cycle and biodegradability, like in a perfect world, would we all be working with 100% plastic free biodegradable like, you know, we all of the amazing things that we want to see exist, like, of course. Um, but sometimes you need like a fabric backing might not be durable enough to actually be created for footwear. So they'll test out of footwear as a category entirely. So we might not be able to use certain backings over other ones. So um, I think it's a lot about where is the industry heading towards? Like, of course, we all know what our ideal situations are, um, but 
until those things exist, you know, it's stuff that we're working towards or, um, you know, criteria that we're, we're seeking and things that we're actively looking to build out. Um, but a lot of the time it is dependent on the type of material you're using and why you're using it. Mm -hmm. Alex, I, I want you to answer this, but um, I mean, add on to this, but I just saw this question that kind of reminds me of um, what uh, we were just saying, it's from Catherine. And she's asking, can Modern Meadow expand on what its product offering is? Is it a matte material or a film? Sure, so this, is very, this is tied into this question too, uh, tied into what we've just been speaking about. So um, Modern Meadow's current commercial offering is called Biotex and it is a coated textile, which is on the Everlane tote bag and the Sunreeve Vegan Terra Leather collection. And so this is that first product offering the bioalloy itself is actually a liquid, right? Mm -hmm. So it's extremely versatile. So it can go on a coated textile. It doesn't have to. And so we're not ready to speak about this publicly yet, but we are doing some uh, active research programs into other materials. Um, and we're excited at the possibilities of its um, versatility across all the design space. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you. Um, there was another question here I wanted to bring up. Um, no, we did that one already. Oh, here we go. This is from Steve, and he's wondering, what are the metrics of durability? Sorry, I guess this is Alex again. I'm sorry, Alex. <laughs> it depends on what you're measuring for. If you're measuring for color durability, you may do those color light fastness, wash fastness tests. I think maybe what he's getting at would be the, the durability associated with maybe some kind of abrasion resistance. Mm -hmm. um, so we often measure that with an industry standard test to understand how, you know, where over different cycles can happen. And we do that with testing such as a Martindale abrasion test, for instance. That's one example of how durable a material is, or also its ultimate tensile strength. And so there are things that we, we test for and design for routinely in the lab. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. um, things we can control as well through just changing a few of the ingredients around our bioalloy formulation. And of course, how you process a material also can impact a material's properties, how fast you might run a line, um, how much stretch you might put on something. That all has a big impact into final materials and if you need a coating on it or not. I would like to just mention also the same for us. You know, we're, for the durability, it's, it is, you know, we've, we've invented a a, a technology where you can make a multitude of different materials. So, you know, we can go into our lab and work with a car manufacturer and get a certain type of texture durability they're looking for, and then, you know, others the same. So um, I think that that's probably um, just a good thing to add that the same for me, I, I'm working with all different types of durabilities that people are looking for. And so is that where, so durabilities, so again, this is where I would love to talk about inputs, if you don't mind. Um, I know you're generally using agricultural waste, uh, which I think mm -hmm. is really fascinating, especially the idea of taking waste and making making from waste. Um, which is really, so can you talk about any of those inputs? Yeah, I had mentioned earlier a little bit, so I'll just re-mention that quickly. You know, where the the, ag the fields themselves, they they farm year round in Italy. They have greenhouses, so we're staying in Italy, um, and we are getting um, from these three different areas from the actual farm, from the distribution plants. You know, where the, all the trucks go for all the distribution. There's a lot of um, fruit and vegetable waste there, and then food production. You know, making some carrot juice or whatever it might be. So, um, so. So we're getting it from those places and and I'll just, um, you know, throw it out there exactly, you know, maybe what we're doing with it a little bit so that you can understand where if you think about something like um, a mango um, and, and, and uh, even a tomato or different fruits and vegetables, they already have a really nice surface where it's similar to leather in some ways. Right. So we're working with um, the materials so that we're we're like I said previously, we're taking the fruit and the vegetable and we're working with it to create these different powders that we're able to use in our chemistry kitchen where we're able to make a multitude of different things. But we're staying with all um, reclaimed fruits and vegetables that are unedible and unusable in and all so, the categories. And, so, and what those fruits and vegetables, are you looking for fibrous fruits? Like 
there must be properties about you know, that. We've done so many. We have 40 catalog now. We do more every single week. Um, we've even had fun testing roses recently. Okay. So we're wow. we're not going with one or the other. That is what's so unique about our patent. We have a technology to be able to use all of them. And so it's an exciting thing to be able to come up with each one. We're seeing different responses clearly, mm -hmm. but as we use them together, as we work with different um, ones and learn how they dry, how they, how they perform, how they attach, how they do different things, um, we know some outperform others. And then we, we work in, in that way by using every single one of them. That way there'll be no running out of raw material for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot of food waste. So. Yeah. Case, I have a question for you. What improvements would you like to see uh, ha still happening in the next gen space? Or it could be the manufacturing space as well. What do you feel like you're still you know, yearning for? I mean, I think we're all after the same things at the end of the day. And I feel like even just being a part of this um, conference, we've seen, I, I mean, I've been working with Next Gen Materials since 2019. I was one of the first U.S. brands to work with Apple Leather, which is still one of my, my main materials that I use. And even in the last few years, like I've seen so much of the actual plant and bio-based content increase. And I think that's what we're all working towards is that like that 100% plastic free, which Rebecca's, well, she's on it. Like I know Modern Meadow is working towards it. There's, there, I've had conversations yeah. with people even in private chats that are like through this conference that are 90% bio-based. And um, I think that's so incredible. That's, I mean, it. I get asked all the time and I like to be super transparent about Apple and I think it's important that we all talk about the imperfections and the transparency as much as the the wins and the things that are going well. So Apple's currently 50%. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we talk about what we want to achieve and what we're working towards. Um, but in a perfect world, I want I want 100% um, plant-based. I want things that, I mean, wouldn't it be great if things could even be home compostable, but um, shoes are a little bit more complex than just the main yeah. material. So Maybe I 60 that. parts that might be hard. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, there's a laundry list of things we want to see, but you know, it would, it's about, you know, what do we do to get, you know, what are those intermediary steps until um, some of these technologies are really available uh, more widely on the market. So Alex, I know that you're, you, you know, you're doing production for, you know, for Everlane, et cetera, but when are do you, when will you be scalable in a more commercial way for more brands to be able to participate in your materials? So I think, you know, right now our, our, our engine to commercialization for a certain part of our material set is going to be through Biofabrica. And so we're, we're scalable and adoptable right now. Okay. Um, it's, just a, it's a matter of um, how we prioritize that. Um, so as you know, um, the, the announcements were made with Everlane where we have more scalable material coming out in the fall for a broader um, amount of material. And the same thing with Sun Reef. So that's the beauty about the technology is establishing yeah. these, not just last mile partnerships to actually create material that the yeah. brands want, but also the ability to use existing infrastructure yeah. allows us to just be influential and deliver those sustainable materials today. Yeah. And Rebecca, how about your material? Because you're also going to sell your material, right? It's not just going to be for your shoes. You're going to be selling it to other businesses. Yes, right? yes, exactly. Yeah, we're going for, you know, every everything everyone else is, you know, home decor, cars, even boats. Um, so, yeah, for our material, we're excited because we're closing seed funding. Um, it's been a long road and it's exciting to be at that phase. We're going to series A and then we're building out a pilot lab. So we're going to be making the first sheets of, of the um, materials for commercial sale, but we're going to have a limited production in the beginning. Um, I would say it's looking like the early 2023, we can start collaborating with some projects to make some small productions in the, in the pilot lab. And then we're going to move to the next phase, which is really great, because if we back up to 2015 and 16, when I was working with those textile mills, I've known these owners of these textile mills in Italy for, I mean, two decades. And I love La Monta, by the way. Love, love. <laughs> I've used them for 20 years. Um, so um, basically, I think that it's, it's an exciting time because I have these relationships with them. So we're going to be able to move very quickly to scale. So I'm going to go straight from this pilot lab where we're able to start working with chosen partners 
then we're going to go straight into um, what we've developed is, is something similar to what Alex is mentioning, something that's material science that's workable with what's already existing in the material textile world and, and production. So we're able to work um, directly with a textile mill and partner with them to get it out to everyone. And that's the plan. So we only have a few minutes left. And thank you, Rebecca, for that. Um, but Jessica, I wanted to uh, let everyone know that you actually really did diligence on, on experimenting with, a, I shouldn't say experimenting, sampling with a lot of different materials, so much so, and, and again, in the spirit of sharing, in the spirit of moving the needle forward, you did this. Uh, Jessica wrote an ebook, and it, it, it's available, and you can find out her learnings through her sampling, and as well as the production run. So I think that's really fascinating. Um, it includes from the size the material is available in, like, you know, um, what are the minimums, uh, the price, all that sort of thing. So Jessica put together an incredible piece there. Um, I have this question that uh, is from the audience. I, I'm sorry, Jessica, did you want to comment on that so bad? It was terrible of me. Uh, just, just to say thank you for mentioning it. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it was all, it's basically just compiling all of the information that I've had. Like, okay, what's the MOQ for that? that particular skew from that particular com company and what, how many colors does this come in? And, you know, so it's just all. From... <laughs> it's an incredible body of work. It's, it's an incredible body of work and so useful. It's, it's incredibly practical. Thank you. So, cool. Awesome. You did that. Um, this is the last question from the audience and it's from Catherine and she writes, has modern meadow tried their bio alloy technology on mycelium based material or just textiles or vegan leather? Yes, so as I mentioned, it's an extremely versatile technology. We, uh, we do work right now, commercially, offering that material on coated textiles. And the, coat, and the textiles we have are extremely versatile. So you can pretty much coat on any textile that you need. Um, mm -hmm. And that basically is brand specific. And we work with those brands to make those options available. Um, and so we also do that in the R&D lab also to understand um, essentially, you know, how, what, what's the adhesion like between our technology and the textile and things like that. So options are open for that. And um, yeah. Interesting. Thank you. We have like 30 seconds left. So <laughs> this has been so much fun. Last wish, like what's the hope for, what does everybody have for hopes, wishes, dreams? Everybody don't stop. <laughs> Keep yeah, don't. going. There you go. That's a very important part. Great way yeah. to yeah. Don't don't give it up. Yeah. Lots of different components too, like not just the materials, but what about the linings? What about the heels? I'm working the, on that, Casey. Inner, yeah, I've got some heel material that I I'm working that. on now. So, but it's about and the whole part of it, the piece of whatever the product is. It's not yeah. just one thing. It's it's the combination of everything together. Mm -hmm. For sure. Super That's awesome. I think I have to stop now because yeah. I think we're doing a break for the on-demand viewers. Um, so let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, <laughs> I think we will have to leave. <laughs>